everybody, it's me, Jordan, aka Mary Helsing, and I hope everybody had a great holiday season and welcome to the new year. So for today to start off 2016, I'm gonna do something really special today. Now I noticed that a lot of people out there on the internet do a top 10 list of things, most notably movies. So I decided I would like to participate in this meme as well. Now I've seen a lot of movies over the past decade and probably over the years. Some great, some not so great, and all the rest are in the middle. Now, basically what I've done is I put a list of movies. The reason I picked these movies, not only because I like them, but because I want to explain to them what makes them such really great movies, camera-wise or film-wise, or why does the story connect deeply with me. So that's why I'm gonna like explain everything to you and just talk about it and just be chill about it. So here are my top 10 personal favorite movies and away we go. Number 10, Frida. Now the reason why I like this movie is because out of all the docudramas I've seen, this is one of my favorite docudramas that tells the entire life story of one of my favorite artists, Frida Kahlo. Now this movie is directed by Julie Taymor, who also worked on The Lion King on Broadway. And what is so amazing about this movie is that not only does she get really great actors and good cinematography, but she really tried to keep it as historically accurate as possible because the real Frida Kahlo, she has been through so much physical and mental pain that she decided to channel all of her emotions and her passion through her art, which is why most of her art is just so surreal and crazy and it's there to tell a story. And when Julie Taylor um, directs this, she really incorporates a lot of her paintings into the scenery and she based a lot of the music off of the titles from her, from Frida's work, and Salma Hayek also did like just a brilliant job playing Frida as a person because she really, she really makes you connect to her as a person as well as an artist. Number nine, Metropolis. Out of every single silent film that I have seen, I'm gonna have to say Metropolis is one of the most eye-popping silent films ever. Most silent films that people are aware of are the stuff like Charlie Chaplin or the Keystone Cops, the ones where it's always about the slapstick and the chase scenes and the like. Whereas in Metropolis, what's different about American silent films is that this is definitely German expressionist films. German expressionist films means that there are films and scenes where everything is layered and there are weird angles and there's overexposure onto the film. And they sometimes want to speed up the film on purpose to affect the way people move. And they do it in such a very primitive and hurried fashion. This is one of the earliest sci-fi films to ever exist. And this came out in 1922, before there was Star Wars or Star Trek or any of the famous sci-fi films that we would ever watch. Because Sci-fi films today are usually CGI, but if you look at Metropolis, a lot of sci-fi films today would get a lot of inspiration from this movie because the way how they set up the dystopian city, and if you look at this, the entire city, it would look like Coruscant from the Star Wars movies, or maybe like scenes from any other sci-fi film, and, and also, the acting is definitely so brilliantly well done, especially with Bridget Helm, who played Maria, and also the machine lady, Hell. I mean, she really does a great job going from being sweet and innocent to being almost crazy and insane when she is the machine lady. And another thing I love about that movie is that they bring in, not only is it a sci-fi film, but they bring in a lot of moral values and biblical references about the end of the world or the tower of Babylon and they do such a really good job creating these big sets and references to tie in to what is going on when the entire metropolis is descending into 
hysteria and close to the end of the world. I actually wrote an entire paper about this film during my video film editing class and one of the pieces that I wrote written in my paper is that they sometimes do like these multi exposure layerings in certain scenes like especially the scene where they put all of the eyes in just one film to make it look like they're all watching Helm dancing and it's really creepy. And there's another scene just like this, except it's the faces of all of the workers eagerly listening to the fake Maria manipulating all of their minds and telling them to get rid of the tech technology. So Metropolis is a very innovative film and if you are a sci-fi fan I would say try looking up this film online and it's a really good film so you could see where it all started. Number eight Spirited Away. Now I have been a fan of anime films ever since I was young and I remembered watching Pokemon but as soon as I discovered this movie called Spirited Away it really changed my vision of anime forever because I remembered seeing this movie when I was 10 years old and I expected it to be like what traditional anime is which is usually very clean and mostly very similar to other stories but when the minute I watched this film what makes Spirited Away so brilliant is because the animation on the scenery and especially the characters is just so different and extremely detailed and it really has a thought-provoking story that would apply to both kids and adults alike. Basically the plot line for Spirited Away is about this little girl named Shihiro who is not really interested in moving to a new neighborhood along with her parents until one day her parents discover this portal that leads into the spirit world where the centerpiece is this ancient Japanese bathhouse and through Shihiro's experience, she learns how to grow as an individual. Now the reason why Spirited Away is definitely one of Miyazaki's masterpieces is that this was the movie that really made him famous and this was the movie that really got me to like most of Miyazaki's work because everything about the animation is just so out there and each character is very exaggerated and startling and sometimes very terrifying. Like for example, Yubaba or No Face or all the creatures in the back bathhouse. I mean, it gives you like, it gives you chills to like see these types of creatures, but what makes the animation so good is that they not only exaggerate the characters, but they really humanize them and they make you relate to these characters. Another thing that is so unique about the story is not only does it feel a little similar to Alice in Wonderland, but at the same time it feels quite similar to Homer's The Odyssey because each time in the story, Shihiro will come face to face with a dangerous task and learn how to grow as an individual through this experience and these tasks. And that's what makes it so meaningful to a lot of people because everybody feels a little nervous when they come face to face with a really dangerous situation. But as long as they just learn to take their time and handle the situation with grace and patience, then they would learn to like not be afraid of everything. This movie is definitely the reason why I really love a lot of Miyazaki's film work and I'm a Ghibli fan and I'm proud of it. Number seven, Kill Bill part one and two. Most Tarantino fans would consider Pulp Fiction to be Tarantino's masterpiece, but for me, it's Kill Bill part one and two. And the reason why I love this movie so much is because it's definitely one of the movies that really has an empowering female lead who is out for revenge for the people who've wronged her. The plotline is about this bride who suddenly gets shot on her wedding day and you don't understand why. Somehow she survives and gets her revenge on the people who attacked her. The reason why I consider part one and two to be a single movie because if you watch them both separately, the story won't really make sense and you'll think to yourself, what is going on? And another thing that is really great about this movie is that 
What Tarantino does in this movie is that he takes so many elements from spaghetti westerns to samurai movies to kung fu movies and he combines them all together into one unique story and he does a brilliant job at it. This movie has some really great scenes, especially when uh, the bride goes to Japan and there are some really cool looking characters like the sushi bar guy who gives her like the sword or like Gogo Yubari who has like the giant mace that attacks her and especially Odin Ishii who like just is part of the gang but she really attacks her with the giant katana. And the highlight of this movie is that epic sword fight in the snow with that amazing music, like the song, Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood. It's just so epic. Everything else is also epic too in part two, especially when you finally get to see Bill. And I have to admit, David Carradine is one cute bastard. You know what I mean? If you're a fan of Pulp Fiction, but you haven't seen Kill Bill, I would advise you check out this movie because I personally think this is Tarantino's masterpiece. Number six, The Ring, the English version. The reason why I think this is definitely one of the most unique American horror remakes ever, in my opinion, because unlike American horror movies that we watch today, most of the time it's usually very gory and they shock you with a lot of gross scenes and loud noises and it's a little less about the plot. While it's a little different from the Japanese version, The Ring has very little gore and most of the atmosphere really has the sense of Asian horror, what most Asian horror movies are like because it has that sense of fear of the unknown and you don't know what is happening and what is coming out in the darkness. It really touches upon that traditional fear. The plotline basically revolves around the cursed videotape that you watch and you would die in seven days. And it's all about the mystery about finding this tape and where did this tape come from and why is it showing all of this disturbing imagery. And it's really creepy. I, I remember seeing this when I was a kid when it first came out and I remember going to the bathroom I don't know, five times because I was that scared. I mean, it was in the big screen and like all this disturbing stuff is happening and I'm to like, nope. It's a little different from the original film because in the original film, while it had the same element of creepiness, the special effects weren't really as great because, especially with the scene when Sadako first comes out of the TV, but you don't really see that much of the background uh, coming on. But in the American version, they really stepped up their game with the special effects and to make it look like Samara is really coming out of the TV for real. I mean, that scene was definitely the highlight of the whole movie because it's like, you're really seeing her coming out for real and you feel like you just want to run. This is definitely the movie that really started the trend of horror on the internet because what's actually kind of crazy about it is that somebody out there actually posted the entire cursed video on YouTube just to mess with people. I would advise people don't try to look for this video because I don't want people dying in seven days in this video. So The Ring definitely gets my vote for one of the best creepiest horror movies in my opinion. Number five, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Now here's the craziest part about this version of the film. This was directed by Francis Ford Coppola, the same guy who did the Godfather movies. And what is really great about this movie is that there have been countless, no pun intended, the reason why this one is definitely one of my favorite adaptations out of all of the adaptations is because most of the adaptations of Dracula mostly focused on the horror and what a horrible person Dracula truly is. But in this adaptation, they really focused on the tragic love story and they really amplified that a little bit while sticking closer to Bram Stoker's original novel. And another thing that I find really genius about this is that they brought in some pieces of history from the real guy, Vlad Sepp 
Deppish the third, and they mix that in to make it look like this is his backstory, and this is how he becomes a vampire, to try to find his long-lost love. While most people really favor Bela Lugosi as Dracula, because he really provided the voice and the creepiness of the character, Personally, I thought Gary Ullman also did a really amazing job as Dracula because not only did he brought out the creepiness and the scary untrustworthiness of the character, he still brought out the tragedy and the sympathetic side of Dracula because he just feels lonely and he wants to find somebody to love him as he is, which is a little out of character, but it's still kind of cool. What's also really great about this movie is that Coppola really brings out a lot of creepiness to the camera work and the settings, especially when you see Dracula's castle. Unlike what most adaptations, they always show the perfect looking castle, whereas this, the castle in the movie, almost looked like it was like a decaying body, just close to dying, and it's descending into shabbiness, and nobody's really there. And the scenery is just so perfect. It captures... Dracula's personality, and also the special effects makeup is so creepy, they really captured how creepy the vampires are, especially when Dracula changes different forms, and also with the special effects, they use pretty much practical special effects and layer it over, and this is like really good special effects that you would see like today, but this was made in 1992. Like for example, the shadows that go around the castle, which is actually Dracula, but this, there was nothing like you've ever seen this before. It was so creepy and unique and amazing. Not only is this just a great vampire story, but it's definitely the best vampire movies in my opinion because Unlike what most vampire movies are today, they really touch upon what vampires were truly like in the past. And this rates up to one of my top five in my top ten countdown. Number four, the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Okay, the reason why I love this movie so much is this was the ultimate genre breakthrough. This was the movie that really started all types of midnight cult movies that have a huge following. It was a moment in time and it really defined everything about the 70s because the 70s was usually a time of freedom. It was a time of sexual empowerment and it didn't matter if you were gay, lesbian, or bisexual, or even transgender. Most people enjoyed this movie because of the audience participation and the comedy and most people look up to it especially with the LGBT community. They look up to this movie because this movie really shows that it didn't matter whether you were gay, lesbian, or straight or whatever sexual gender you are. You have to be yourself and not care what anybody else thinks. This is a movie that really has the ultimate cult following. It has epic music. I've been to the Rocky Horror Picture Show numerous times and what makes it even better is that I even got a free selfie with the asshole himself, Barry Boswick. Rocky Horror Picture Show is the number one cult classic and that is why it is in my top four favorite movies. Number three, V for Vendetta. Out of every single action film I've seen, I think this is definitely the one action film that really has a deep, empowering political message. The plot line revolves around what most dystopian future films are like because the whole world has descended into a huge dictatorship and it's so controlling and it almost kind of mirrors what would happen in, with the Nazis and how they arrest people because of who they are. And one guy who hides behind a Guy Fox mask tries to broadcast himself to convince the people of London to turn against this corrupt society and try to change this dictatorship into a democracy for the better. This is a really dark but really important film that would apply to all of us because it would really 
teach people to try to be aware of our society that is going on today. V for Vendetta shows a lot of elements that go on with today's society, such as surveillance and the police coming into our business. We have to watch out for this disturbing stuff that is happening in our own society, and we, and we have to learn what can we do to change it. And also what is so great about it is that V is such a very important character. Not only is he badass, but he also drops so many truth bombs about our society. And that mask is what inspires the group Anonymous. They use this mask as a symbol for their view of justice. V for Vendetta is a really important political movie that we should all learn from, and that's why V for Vendetta rates up to my third favorite movie. Number two, West Side Story. This was Stephen Sondheim and Leonard Bernstein's musical adaptation of Romeo and Juliet, but it touches up on a much more important subject than the, the love story. What it really touches upon is racial tolerance and how all the immigrants want to try to fit into our rapidly changing society and why we want to try to connect and try to like get along despite our differences. And the reason why this is my favorite musical is that I really love the music, I can easily sing along to it, and the dancing is so intense. And the music is just so important because each of the lyrics really touch upon these important subjects that we need to learn from. And by the end of the movie, no spoilers, it really teaches us that we really shouldn't try to look to hurt each other because we're different from our heritage or even our cultures. So that's why West Side Story rates up to my second favorite movie. And now my number one favorite movie is Life of Pi. Life of Pi tells the story of a boy named Pi who gets stranded out at sea in a robo with a Bengal tiger. This is a movie that touches upon the elements of spirituality and Hindu mythology references and the art of survival. And what's really unique about it is that every time you watch this movie, you see a lot of symbolism to Pi's personality. Like for example, the tiger, the tiger is there as symbolism for Pi's own animalistic nature coming out while he's struggling to survive out in the wild. The reason why Life of Pi really touches my heart so much because the movie was more than just about a boy trying to survive out in the wilderness with a tiger. I mean, this is a movie that tells the story about a boy who was not really well liked in school and but fortunately knows everything about books and math and learning things and he has a very open mind and when he gets into a dire situation when he loses his family and is out on the boat with a tiger he learns how to struggle to survive when he's in when he's in the dangers of life and what's really great about this movie is that the movie does come to a surprise happy ending because after all of the struggles that Pi had to go through, Pi learns that sometimes all you gotta do is that you have to let go of the pain from your past and just move on and your future is just right ahead of you. Sometimes it's nice to look back on the journeys you've accomplished, but it's always important to look in front of the future. And that's why Life of Pi is definitely my number one favorite film ever. So that was my top 10 favorite personal films of all time. And I just want to say thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. And also, if you want to explain what are your top 10 favorite movies, feel free to tell me about it in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe to Mary Helsing and I will be back for more content in the future. I'll see you later.